Welcome to the podcast. I'm hanging out in Sherwood Park with Jacqueline Jasic, founder and coconista at Jasic Chocolate Couture. Is that correct? That is correct. So interesting. First of all, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. And how are you, Mark? I'm great, thank you. So I was doing a little bit of fact checking uh, this morning as I was waiting for you. And coconista is not a thing. No, uh, it's definitely not a thing. I made it up because if your job doesn't exist, you make it up. Okay, so yeah. now I'm worried about should I have fact checked everything you sent me? Because <laughs> the first thing that you sent me turns out to be false. Well, it's not false. It's just made up. Okay, it's made up. Yeah, yeah. So it's now true <laughs> it because used to I made be it false. up. Yeah, now yeah. it's true. It's the truth. So okay, describe to me what a coconista is. Okay, so when I was trying to decide what I wanted to do when I grew up, I wanted to do something that brought me joy, and joy to me is fashion and chocolate. So I chose the two things and became a chocolate designer. Okay. Or a chocolatier, but a chocolate really didn't reflect sort of what I was doing as a chocolate designer. So I came up with the term coconista to make it true. (laughs) To make it true. Um, Okay, so, and that was one of the things when we first met, we met at the Christmas in November in Jasper, and I had never heard of that concept in terms of like taking, you know, fashion, which is one of your passions, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and combining it with chocolate. So, so how did you come up with the idea to combine those two? Or why was it important to combine your two passions? Well, I mean, ultimately, I wanted to combine my two passions to, to create my dream job. Mm-hmm. So then I really explored what joy is to me. And okay. I mean, I could have gone the route of fashion because I right. think that's always what I wanted to be when I grew up. Right. Um, but I decided to use chocolate as my canvas or my fabric for fashion just okay. because I really love food. And then it's four dimensional. So I have form, color, function, but the fourth dimension of flavor with chocolate. So as a designer, I think it's mm. super fun. So it was just something that I made up and truthfully didn't even know if it would work. Yeah. So I just wanted to do this thing and see what happened. And I love that. So what it was your kind of origin story? Because, you know, I've heard varying different stories about how you started. Oh, uh, interesting. Uh, no, I, oh, I'm curious. <laughs> no, I just remember when uh, there was someone who, who sent me a, a little bit of a backstory on how you started. And uh, you looked at it and was like, mm, that's not quite true. So <laughs> so why don't you tell us how, how did it start? Um, like, because I feel like, you know, your husband has been a big supporter in this. For sure. So um, it started with, um, so I grew up in New Zealand, uh, came back to Canada. I'd had this idea of chocolate and fashion, but never had really done anything other than train in chocolate. So I did an online course, started yeah. playing with chocolate, treating people to chocolate while living in New Zealand. And then I came back and I, you know, was working a corporate job and I thought, I just really want to give this chocolate fashion thing a go. So my husband and my dad built a commercial kitchen in the house, fiance at the time. Um, and so uh, it was just a bedroom downstairs converted into a commercial kitchen. And then I started working evenings and weekends at markets and making chocolates while still working my corporate job. Nice. So it kind of just started from really, really small in my basement. Um, but I did have a really big dream. So, and obviously successful because he went from fiance to husband and not fiance to <laughs> ex-boyfriend or something like that. So, yeah, he yeah. did make me promise, get the wedding, you know, so we did get married first and then started the chocolate gig. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it kind of all happened at the same time. So, and what's involved, like when I think of a commercial kitchen, I, I y- you know, it seems like a big commitment for them to, you know, you make it sound, I think, simpler than it is. Oh, we'll just make you a commercial kitchen. So, so what's entailed, like, what does that entail? And then how much pressure did that put on you to be like, okay, this, maybe I should really focus on this. (laughs) Well, I think, I mean, a chocolate kitchen is a little bit different than a normal kitchen because we don't use a lot of high heat. So no ovens or anything like that. So, um, it wasn't that big of a deal. Truthfully, like my dad can make anything happen from a construction perspective. Um, and so it was, yeah, six weeks, eight weeks uh, to build it. And then we just kind of opened December 1st, which by the way is a terrible time to open a chocolate business. Um, didn't you open your second location roughly around December 1st as well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good point. (laughs) I didn't even think about parallel, but yes, I did. Um, And so it wasn't that complicated. And I mean, I spent $14,000. So that was the initial investment in building the kitchen and inventory molds, getting the brand up and running was $14,000. And I spent half of that budget. So $7,000 on branding and the other seven on the kitchen. And so 
but I think branding, from there. like branding is important, especially with how you, I think having that angle of fashion, yeah. I think you, you probably were very conscious or aware of how important your branding was going to be for you. It, it totally was. And I think that's yeah. why I invested half of my budget on branding yeah. and it's still the same brand we have today. Nice. So what makes you different? So there's, a, to me, it's the fashion. Is that what really separates you from other chocolate companies? Or what, what would you say separates you and makes you unique in the Yeah, in the I industry? would say the fashion thing is probably one of the biggest differentiators in um, how we operate. Um, in terms of being different, I mean, there's so many great quality chocolatiers out there. And I think the more that there are of us, the better in that um, we just really need to have a conversation about where chocolate comes from, what it yeah. is. But the fashion piece, it's its really what sets Jasic apart. And what I love specifically about the fashion is, because I was trying to think like, I've seen your chocolates, I've, I've, I've tried your chocolates, my kids love your chocolates, as do I and my wife. They're beautiful, right? So they are, they do look like pieces of art and you, and you kind of feel a little bit guilty eating them because it's just like, but... The other thing that, that you said that kind of struck me is how you, similar to fashion, you launch seasonal collections, which yeah. I thought was really cool. So maybe talk about how you came up with that idea and why you do that. And so that's how fashion is infused in the business is the seasonal collections. Right. Um, and so it just helps us reinvent you know, who we are, what our muse is for, for the season. So it's really fun for our team yeah. to do the seasonal collections. Um, but we also have chocolate bars that are inspired by fashion icons or um, have their own fashion persona. So they, all of our chocolate bars have names. Okay. Um, and there is a Jackie bar not named after myself. I am not my own fashion icon. That was a big mistake and an oversight on my part. It was, <laughs> was Jack, it? Oh, Jack Nass. Nass. Okay. Yeah. So you or Kennedy. I, Look at yeah, you, I, I fashion and chocolate. You, you got right. this. <laughs> that's right. Um, so I'm guessing around Easter, then you have like the white chocolate bunny. Is that right? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely no. no white chocolate bunny. Uh, we have a dark chocolate bunny. But if the white chocolate bunny, if we were to make one, and it's not to say we wouldn't ever, it would be made using fine chocolate, which is a, quite wax. different than confectionery. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what is the what? So what is the difference then? Because I was always under the impression that white chocolate wasn't even chocolate. Is that am I wrong to say that? No, and I think that's a massive misconception in the market. Is that white chocolate? isn't chocolate but it, it i mean it's not that simple it depends so fine white chocolate means that the cocoa bean there's still part of the cocoa bean in the chocolate and the cocoa bean itself is made up of cocoa butter and cocoa solids cocoa okay. solids being like cocoa powder so in fine white chocolate the cocoa butter is pressed out of the bean and milk and sugar are added to make a white chocolate okay. that is chocolate scary white bunny that's 299 from london drugs is not chocolate because there's no part of the cocoa bean in that it's palm oil and a bunch of other things why do you always pick on london drugs when you when you <laughs> okay, maybe not london you... drugs could be shoppers could be <laughs> um, amazon <laughs> okay so running a business um what, so you started here in sherwood park correct yeah my basement was in sherwood okay. park and we expanded commercially in 2012 in sherwood park and why did you choose so i get why you you, you lived where you created the commercial kitchen but when you looked at expanding or, or actually having something outside of your house why why was Sherwood Park still sort of the right option for you? Well, I love the community of Sherwood Park, but from a personal level, um, I did the basement gig while working my corporate job for a year and a half, but then we also started a family at the same time. Okay. So when I was looking to leave the basement operation and go com like into a commercial space, I had a brand new baby. So I wanted to be close like to home right. at all times. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So. That makes you just a nice mom, really. Oh, well, thank you. I, <laughs> I, I hope he agrees. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. He's still young, right? 12 and a half. Oh, so, yeah. He's yeah. pretty, pretty um, feisty now, for I'll sure. I'll buy him a beer when he's 18 and get the real <laughs> scoop. What was it like? Um, okay, so running a business. How many people, you know, like, let's just talk about as it starts, you know, how do you decide, you know, when you need to hire and, and kind of bring us up to speed of where you're at now? Sure. So we are a hyper seasonal business. We do the majority of our business in six months of the year with 60% of our annual revenue being done at Christmas. So the oh, six wow. weeks leading up to Christmas. So it's incredibly intense. So we always bring in seasonal staff around um, Christmas time because we just need 
hands and bodies and yeah. energy to, to get the orders done. Um, and then in the summer, we really retreat into sm a smaller team. Um, so at the peak, we're at about 30 people. And when we retreat in the summer, um, a lot of people want the summer off, which is great. Uh, yeah, we go like down to about, I don't know, about 18, 19. Yeah. And I know being in your seminar when we were in Jasper, you talked a lot about your team. What does, I'm always curious how people build their team in terms of, you know, did you have an idea of what you wanted for a culture or was it something that happened organically? And maybe just describe how you, how you see the culture of your company. For sure. So um, I think our culture is probably one of the things that is the most important in the business. Um, and we have five core values that we're really tight on and joy being the number one. So we, you know, the business operates to bring joy, but we need to have joy internally as well because it really starts from the inside. Right. Um, teamwork, excellence, artistry, and I'm missing one. It doesn't matter. I'm missing one, but um, I do know them by heart. Bashing, um, <laughs> bashing London drugs. Is that yeah, one yeah, of the, no. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely not. Um, uh, so in terms of when I added, when I add team members, I really look for a cultural fit over skill set because we can teach mm. anybody anything yeah. in the business, but it's really making sure that the people have um, sort of the right values that align and the right energy and that are okay in slow times and can really fly when it's busy. Does liking chocolate have to be one of their things? And I, I say that kind of being silly, but at the same time, I, I have hired people like through my Alberta beer festivals um, who don't necessarily drink beer. You know, they might have a different skill set, but does your whole team enjoy chocolate? Uh, I would say yes. Um, I, everyone likes chocolate for sure. Some love it, some like it. Um, <laughs> chocolate's one of those things though, like I, I don't have a sweet tooth, right. but I like fine chocolate. I don't yeah. eat, I won't eat a whole box though. Yeah, yeah. Unless professionally required, which sometimes <laughs> requires me to do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, of course everyone likes chocolate for sure. Um, so challenges, I'm curious because I think right now, you know, we, if you look at the news every day, it's, you know, increased costs, whether yes. it's, you know, labor costs, whether it's, um, I'm sure just a lot of the inputs that you're using, whether it's packaging, cause even with you, like I, I would think, especially with you because your packaging is so unique and so, you know, fashion forward, I guess, um, I'm guessing is, is, is cost increasing costs is that one of your biggest challenges? Uh, increasing costs is definitely the biggest challenge yeah. that we have and affordability of living. So we need to make sure that our team is making a livable wage as well, like over and above minimum mm -hmm. wage. Um, but everything is, is sort of getting to be pretty crunchy um, in terms of increasing costs um, and bringing in transportation, like getting cocoa beans here. Yeah. Sherwood Park is incredibly expensive. And so we're really, really watching our spending for sure without compromising on quality. So one of the things you had a quote, it said, we are focused on trying to be the best at what we do so that we can provide value in a tough economy. And I love talking mm -hmm. about the word value because mm -hmm. I, I feel like when I, at least the family that I grew up in, I, you, we were almost taught that value is equals quantity and value equals the lowest price. Like these are the words that people use to define value. Um, I define it differently. I'm curious though, how, how do you, how have you come to define value and how, how can you as a, as a business owner provide that value? For sure. I think value comes down to a set of choices and value to us is making sure that the quality is there, that the um, sustainability and how the ingredients were sourced is there, and that the presentation is there. So 50% of JSIC purchases are gifts. So they're a reflection of the gifter oh, as yeah, well, yeah. right? And so we want to make sure that that gifter finds value in giving our product to somebody else. And then that person will see value in eating it because it's the best. It's worth right. the calories. It's, you know, it's, it's worth everything. So there, there's value there. Um, and value and satisfaction, because if you have one piece of fine, really good tasting chocolate, you'll be just as satisfied, if not more, than having a big chocolate bar that's of average quality. Right. Right? So it's, yeah. it's all about, um, it's not about quantity. It is actually about just enjoyment and, you know, in the smaller piece. 100%. Um, so making the community better. I think, I was wondering if this tied into value too, because one of the things you were talking about is the, your sourcing program for Co I, I'm pronouncing this wrong. Is it's not cocoa? It's cacao, right? So cacao is the bean before it's okay. roasted. Cocoa is the bean after it's roasted. Okay. So they're pretty interchangeable, okay. but they're both the same. 
So products. your sourcing program for cacao and chocolate. So maybe talk about how you do source your products. Okay, for sure. So I think we'll start one step back, just so people understand the difference between a chocolatier and a chocolate maker, because they're two very distinct industries totally. within chocolate. So to use a fashion analogy, because it's the easiest way to describe it, is that chocolate maker is essentially the textile maker. They're the p person making the chocolate right from the cocoa bean. Okay. The chocolatier is the designer. They're the person who is taking that chocolate from the textile maker the chocolate maker and creating the dress or the final bonbon chocolate bar or confection okay um and so um at jasic 10 percent of what we do is the chocolate maker side we're sourcing our beans um and you know creating chocolate with that and as well as the dress or the final product. Right. And then the other 90% is a company uh, called Valrona out of France. And they um, have some of the best chocolate in the world, their B Corp, which is really important to us. But everything we source is of traceable and sustainable um, background. Like it's, right. it's, it's all thoughtfully sourced okay. for sure. And I think one of the reasons I started the bean to bar program is I want the ability to go to origin and meet the farmers and see the power that chocolate does have to transform. Yeah. And, and you, you do enjoy traveling. Yes. Um, so is that, has that become something that the part of your job is to make sure, because I think we see these stamps on products and there's gotten to be so many, you know, stamps that it, as a consumer, sometimes it's, it's hard to know, okay, what do the, what do those stand for and what's meaningful? So for you, one of the words you just used was, was B Corp. So the company you work for, with in France is, is a B Corp. What, what does that mean? And then what are other things that we should be looking for as consumers? Yeah, so B Corp is one of the most interesting ones to me because it means that um, they're looking at all the different types of um, aspects that go into a business, such as environment and people and practices and then you get a score and i can't remember the, how the scoring works but it just means that they're doing a really good job on all the different aspects of the business that brings sort of value to the world yeah um that's something that i would love um you know sort of in the next couple of years to get gsic jsic big um, big of B Corp certification as well. Yeah. Um, one of the big things we do get asked is about fair trade. And that's another one of those labels that you're probably referring right. to. And we are not, we don't look for fair trade. Um, I actually have a bit of a beef with it um, only because it's a really expensive certification to have and the farmers have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. The farmers barely make any money as it is for them to have to pay for a certification so that consumers on this side will buy it. Just sound, it just, it seems wrong to me. I'd rather them use that money for their families yeah. and without, you know, their, their own personal use. It's funny you say that because I was, uh, over COVID I was, I was roasting coffee with a friend who owns a, a roasting, um, a coffee company. And so I went to the person that he buys his green beans from and we were just having that conversation and he said the same thing from a coffee perspective yeah. as he said he, he's he's from Colombia he's like I go I know these farmers he's like fair trade is misleading in that you know yeah to your point the farmers are paying for that certification and there's not necessarily anything above and beyond that 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 they're benefiting from. Exactly, exactly. So it's not to say fair trade is bad as a farmer's choice, but I'm not gonna not choose them because they don't have it. Got you. So yeah. the practices are there. So we use um, for the cocoa beans, um, one origin I from Costa Rica I buy direct, but the um, from Colombia and Dominican Republic, I buy through a third party intermediary called Uncommon Cacao, and they do all the transparency work to make sure that everything is sustainable, okay. ethical. Um, so another thing that uh, when we were talking about community, so a minimum of, of 1% of revenue goes back to community organizations. Yeah, and so that's one of the things I'm probably proudest of is that 1% is at least 1%. We've never actually given 1%, it's yeah. always considerably more. Um, back into community organizations, so it could be through chocolate donations for fundraising events, um, but two of the annual projects that I have done for many years, um, one's Bulembu, it's an organization in the kingdom of Est Eswatini, yeah. um, which is about two hours north of Johannesburg, in, and it's an orphanage for children because in the kingdom they have a really high uh, amount of AIDS and HIV going around and a lot of parents are passing away leaving their kids and so this organization has uh, 400 children in their care and something I'm really passionate about so I've been doing that this will be our 10th year 
And then um, the other one is the Sergeant George Miok Scholarship. So it was a soldier from Sugar Park who lost his life in Afghanistan. Okay. He went to school with my husband. And so we do a scholarship every year of $4,000 through chocolate sales. Um, I developed a collection with his family yeah. that sort of um, were some of his favorite things, his heritage, and we sell that and 100% goes to a scholarship in his name. That's that's awesome. Uh, with the, sorry, how do you pronounce it? Bulambu? Bulambu, yeah. Bulambu. So how did you get connected with that? Yeah, so that's an interesting story. So uh, 10 years ago, they had contacted me because they were bringing the tenors in for this big, really expensive fundraising concert, and they had commissioned JSIC to do a six-piece box of chocolates. Oh, nice. For this fundraising event and it, it was like $25,000 I had to go like it was quite wow. the event um, and I you know it was a paid gig but then I learned more about the organization and what they were doing and I fell in love with it so I thought okay there's six weeks until the event I'm gonna build uh, I can't remember how many boxes it was but I raised $9,000 I'm gonna build extra oh wow and I'm going to raise money because it's $9,000 to refurbish an old home for six children so it's like I can do this I got six weeks so I I built more than they needed for their event of the same collection, sold them, and then the proceeds went oh, to them. So awesome. I did raise the $9,000. Yeah. And every year, I learn more and more about the children, and it's just something that makes my heart sing, so we do it every year. Yeah. Um, so this year, uh, we raised money for um, school shoes for all the children. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I feel like anytime there's kids involved, it's kind of like... I know. Like, I'm you, such you know a sucker. I, mean? I, I am too, 100%. 100%. Um, so... In what you've done, do you have mentors? Do you have people that have, have kind of helped you get to where you are? Yeah, for sure. I've had lots of mentors and I'm part of EO, which is a business organization right. called Entrepreneurs Organization. Yeah. And I think that has been one of the best decisions I've made in terms of business development as well as personal development. Like it right. really pushes me out of my comfort zone. And the thing I like about it is um, just having a really tight network of people who have been really, really successful in business and willing to share their experience. Um, and I have had one-on-one -on -one mentors as well. I had um, Tom Reddle. He was, is, no, was, he's no longer the CEO of Shando's Construction. So okay. like a billion dollar company. Um, so it's pretty cool for a little chocolate company to have access to that kind of wisdom. No doubt. Um, and so um, EO continues to be something that I do spend a lot of energy in yeah. because I love conversations around business and personal personal development and really pushing myself. So when you had your mentor, what was his name, sorry? Tom Reddle. Okay, so how did I'm I think a lot of people are curious about how how does one get a mentor? In that like you know, cuz when I look at kind of my life, I never had a like a specific mentor per se where it was a structured kind of arrangement, yeah. but what I would have is you know, people that I would go for walks with and people that I would talk to or go for coffee with. And then it was kind of after a certain amount of time going, oh, wow, these are my mentors. I never. So was was that your relationship or was it more structured? So that was a structured one and okay. it was through EO. So what they would oh, do okay. is they would they would pair you up with somebody. Nice. Um, and so um, you also had training on how to be a good mentee. Yes. Because I think extracting that information or the wisdom or what you're trying to sort of absorb from your mentor requires mm -hmm. um, some skill on both sides. So both the mentor totally. and the mentee go through training. So that was a very structured thing. Okay. Um, but I've had lots of informal mentors like yeah. you're suggesting. Like I've really surrounded myself with really smart people yeah. and we'll talk informally you yeah. know, about business all the time. And a lot of those are EO people. And so EO is what? entrepreneurs organization okay yeah cool um and how long have you been a part of that uh so i was in it for three years and i took uh two years off during the pandemic because okay. i didn't think a luxury chocolate business was going to survive so i put all of my energy into making sure it did and it actually thrived through the pandemic oh, in the end yeah. and i rejoined again um two and a half years ago okay um, now, you were mentioning something about a challenge you're doing through EO in the, I think it's starting in January. Yes, so, so January 1st. It's creating, and this is sort of my other, um, yeah. I'd say passion is is kind of the, how to implement positive habits. So this struck me as, as super interesting. So it's a, effectively like a five habit challenge. Yeah, exactly. So um, the whole idea is iron sharpens iron. Okay. And so um, one of my EO4 members uh, has come up with this idea of 
challenging ourselves with five small habits every day that will contribute to our larger goals. Okay. So it's kind of this James Clear philosophy as well, right? Yeah. These tiny habits creating totally. change. 100%. And I think Explore 84 is yeah. along these lines as well. Yeah. So everyone chooses five habits for themselves. And then there's also a punishment if you don't <laughs> do it every day. And an accountability partner. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I like that. So yeah. what is the... So do you know what your habits are going to be? I do. And I know what my punishment's going to be, and you're going to laugh. Okay. The, the punishment is cold plunge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if there's nowhere to cold plunge, then a minute cold shower. Um, but I'm going to be doing uh, five. So one is hydration, just uh, being clearer in mind. So it's going to be two liters of water a day, minimum of 30 minutes exercise a day, and that can be structured or exercise or just on the bike downstairs. Right. Um, a meaningful kiss before bed and every morning with my husband. Um, a gratitude practice with my family every day. So that's saying two things that you're grateful for in your day and one that you're grateful for generally as a minimum. And then the last one is, what is my fifth one? Oh, checking in with somebody every day, whether it be a friend mm, or a colleague, I but like a meaningful check-in. Yeah. Just, you know, you think of people, oh, I do. I think of people all the time and I never reach out. Yeah. But actually taking that step and sending a text, hey, thinking of you. Yeah. And in the genuine, like, I, I do think of them. I just need to take that step of actually connecting. No, and, and that's, that's huge. I have people in my life that are bad, like good at that. Um, mm -hmm. in term, and, and it's one of those things where I remember having a conversation with someone and it's, it's kind of like, well, that's just like, they're so good at that. I'm not good at that. And to me, it's, it's actually one of the skills that we, or habits that we could, it, it probably wouldn't be that hard to do, which is I think what one of my friends does is he actually has an Excel spreadsheet with names of people. And then he just goes to the next name every wow. day and it's just like a, text a them. funeral list too makes yeah. it easy <laughs> yeah exactly so he just texts the next person on the list hey how's it going checks in on them wow. and um so it's not necessarily something that you have to be born with that ability of being thoughtful you can actually train your brain to be thoughtful well it's a habit way. i want to have yeah no i like that i yeah. like that so, um that's really important and then my accountability partner super smart He's like, okay, well, what does that look like? What are you saying? So I have a few things to just start triggering, like, who am I going to think of? Like, if I can't, right. I mean, I'm going to struggle to not think of somebody. There's a lot yeah. of people I think of that I just don't send a message to. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, it's, it's interesting because on my way to, I drove uh, here from Calgary this morning, and I was thinking of people, and mm. but I never, you know, I didn't do anything well, you were Beyond driving. That. That's good. You yeah, were. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. But, um, you know, and it's kind of like, and it's one of those things where the longer you go without reaching out, sometimes the harder it becomes. You're you know so, what I mean? Oh, yeah, that's so true. Yeah. So true. And who doesn't like to be on the receiving end of that? Especially if somebody you haven't <laughs> talked to in a year and a half, like, yeah. hey, thinking of you, how are things? Yeah. Like, how cool is that? So it's something yeah. I really do want to bring into my daily practice. Yeah. And it takes two minutes. Yeah. Like I remember a buddy of mine used to do that, but kind of being an asshole, but it was still funny. Like he'd see like <laughs> a dumpster on fire and he'd be like, take a picture and be like, Hey, made me think of you. Hope you're having a good day. So you can, you can kind that of have joyful. some fun. I that. love that. I, mean, I have to <laughs> yeah. do a few things like that too. Yeah. And that's literally probably the nicest example I could have given you. <laughs> um, so in, in the, along the lines of mentorship, have you had an opportunity to be a mentor? Uh, not in a formal way, um, but informally, probably. Um, I don't think I've gained enough experience to really be a good mentor yet uh, yeah. for anybody to really gain any wisdom from what I'm doing. But um, informally, I mean, I love reciprocating and having those conversations. I love giving people business. unsolicited advice <laughs> yeah, totally. all the time. I yeah. love <laughs> yeah. judging. I love giving advice. <laughs> Honey, I'm yeah. being your mentor here. <laughs> Quit being dumb. Um, so, okay, so when you think about you know, I guess whether it's mentors or just people that you've met in your life, what, what is in terms of advice? Like, do you have a piece of advice? that's like the best piece. Uh, and conversely, do you have something that's like, Oh my God, how did I listen to that? Do you have bad advice that you, that you realize? I'm going to lean on the good advice. And I don't even know if it's advice. People have said it before, but it wasn't until I read Greg McEwen's book, um, essentialism mm -hmm. that, that to me completely resonated. So it's advice I often give to people that are overwhelmed. They're just, you know, I think the entrepreneurial journey can be can be very overwhelming is the ability to say no and no gracefully. And I think mm -hmm. that's really what has shaped me over the last, 
I would say five, six years, is the idea that um, there's so many opportunities, there's an abundance of opportunities. And if we're not clear on what joy or happiness or what our goals are, mm -hmm. we're saying yes to the wrong things all the time. Right. So being really clear on that and saying no, and it doesn't always mean no for ever, it could mm -hmm. be no for now, but really being gracious and very sort of mindful of what I'm saying yes to. Yeah. Um, and then that leaves me space to say yes as opportunities come along that are aligned to my priorities that I can say yes because I was finding myself in a place where I was so overwhelmed I couldn't say yes to the things I wanted to because I'd said yes to the wrong things. Did, did that take some practice to learn how to say no to things? For sure and I'm yeah. still not very good at it <laughs> yeah. but you know um, what I do to give myself now is a bit of grace and time and not responding and being so reactive and actually sitting on things and really seeing how it sits with me before I right. say yes. Yeah. Um, so I would say it's not I've heard people say this like power of saying no a lot in terms of advice, yeah. but Greg McEwen's book really sort of shaped. And how that's I do essentialism. It. Essentialism. That's what, okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then I will <laughs> have to be careful because the last book you recommended turned out to be terrible. So I just feel <laughs> really? a little. I'm just kidding. Oh, no. I was gonna say. No, 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 no. I'm it wasn't. halfway through. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, it wasn't. Um, and then. Do you have advice that you find yourself giving? Like if someone at work is having a hard time or someone, do you, is there something that you kind of lean on yourself or that you found yourself repeating more than, than uh, like, I don't know. Sometimes you just think like, I don't, I don't think of myself as having philosophies, but then I'll start talking to someone. I'll be like, oh man, I really say that a lot. Do you, do you have any kind of mantras that you live by? Uh, the ability to say no is definitely one, but I think also I try and break down what the root of the problem is. Okay. I think often what we experience is the symptom. And so I, mm. I do have yeah. like a, a tendency to, to really step back and be like, Hey, what's the root of the problem here? And let's work on that. And I do that with myself too. Right. Yeah. So when I'm in conversation is trying to get the why, you know? Yeah. Five I, times. I like that. You're, you're a hundred percent right. We always, we are always, or typically focused on like okay here's the what we think is the problem it's like yeah. no, no no that's the symptom that's like the problem that's what manifests from the problem like from so, the root problem yeah, yeah for, like so cut it off here and then yeah. that never happens yeah right? exactly actually yeah. one of my old form mates he always used to be like i would go like, do this big monologue <laughs> and then he would be like and what's the problem <laughs> like you know so i think it's just really getting back down to that root and so I, I do try and bring that in all the time yeah no i i like that a lot so you mentioned living in New Zealand. You were actually born in Alberta, though, mm -hmm. right? In yeah. legal Alberta? Legal. Legal. Okay. Yeah, I was yeah. just like, like, I don't know why, but this, as soon as I read legal Alberta, I was like, that sounds like a one horse town. Yeah. What, what is, and <laughs> I I'm not making. there's probably three horses. Yeah, yeah. There's a small town, okay. like a thousand people. Yeah. And there was a drugstore there, legal drugstore. So you can imagine how funny that was at all times is legal yeah. drugstore. Yeah. yeah. It's so silly. And then you moved at the age of 15 to yeah. New Zealand with your family. Yeah. Does your, so I'm just curious and you don't have to answer this, but why did you move to New Zealand? Because my parents were moving. I had to go with them. But like, was no, it for just work joking. or what no, was it? No, no, no. So my parents are great role models. Uh, they had a bunch of goals. Uh, dad was mayor of Legal. Big, that's a okay. big deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, they built a brand new house and you know, they, life was good. And uh, one day he went to work. He was a welder. He'd been there mm -hmm. 25 years and they shut the doors on the factory. Oh, and wow. so most people would be devastated, not my parents. They're like, well, this is a sign from God that we're supposed to be doing something else. Yeah. So we went to visit friends in Calgary that weekend that was already planned. And they were calling for welders in New Zealand. My parents being my parents, like, well, maybe this is a sign from God. Maybe wow. we should consider moving to New Zealand. From the time they saw that article in the paper to the time we were on the airplane, was three months and they we sold everything the brand wow. new house the forks knives cars <laughs> and we had two suitcases each so when they presented this to me and my sister who was 13 so younger at, at that time well she's still younger, still younger yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. The math <laughs> she was 13 out. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um they said do you want to do this new zealand adventure for one year you'll have two suitcases we're going to sell everything uh we're like yeah we definitely want to go to the tropics we had no idea where new <laughs> yeah. zealand was <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, totally so um i ended up staying 12 years Wow. So at 15, because to me, that's that age where, you know, it's, it's a really important age, right? Because, yeah. you know, you're going into high school. And so, you know, I, I know people who moved during that time and they were never able to kind of 
necessarily form deep friendships and they kind of have this like trauma. So to me, I'm like, you were excited for the for the adventure? Yeah. Okay, cool. I, we were Good. both excited. We had no idea what to expect. Yeah. We'd never been. It's not like we went to test the waters first to check it out. Um, like literally, you need to test. Like, so when I was in New Zealand and I was like, I don't do research when I travel. So I assume, yeah, because it's like close to Australia. It must be tropical. Sound, and when it sounds luxurious, or it yeah. sounds like it should be. And we jumped. So I was with some friends. This is kind of like we took a year off in between, like during university. And um, we just like, as soon as we got there, we just hit the beach and jumped in the water. And it was just like, holy <laughs> shit. It's just like, it's like effectively being like doing that in Canada, yeah. you know? Oh yeah, it is not warm. <laughs> yeah, no, they have winters. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and, but we loved it. Like Good. I, you know, I'd never been to school in English before. Yeah. Um, I was, it's kind of British there. I was in a uniform. Uh. So it was very, very different than here, yeah. but we embraced it. And I, some of my best friends are still Kiwis. Yeah. Awesome. And then you went to university there as well? I did. So I went to university, business degree in marketing. Also had a great time at yeah. university. I'm um, yeah. not sure what I learned, but yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> my friends you did are get still my friends from degree, there. So <laughs> yeah, right. same as me, I, I'm a, a commerce degree in marketing and it's like, same. great. Yeah. I had a great time. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think you do though. You do learn. It's just not, um, it's not necessarily a skill that specifically translates to now I can do this. It's a general Let's skill Let's roll set, with that. Right? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure I learned yeah. something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but hey, it sounds like you had fun. So you, but you moved back to Canada, obviously. Um, why? So this is so cliche, but I came back from my cousin's wedding uh, to be bridesmaid in December, and uh, my groomsman partner was now, is now my husband. Oh, wow. Yeah, so super cliche. I was here that for two cliche. weeks for the wedding, yeah. went back to New Zealand, and then was on a plane exactly the same way I went with two suitcases really? 11 years later. Wow. Yeah. So, sorry, 11 years later? Well, I, I went oh, with gotcha. two suitcases, okay, and, yeah. and then, you know, and when then returned. When you were 15, and then you came yeah. back. And so you moved back when you were like, 27. 27 years old. Um, and then what about your family? Does your, cause I, I met your sister, did yeah, I not? And yeah, Jasper. you sure did. Yeah. yeah. So, so they moved back before I did. Oh, so okay. they, I, I stayed a few extra years cause I'd started my career and everything there. Right. So I was kind of going to be there forever. And then I met my, and I met Tim, my husband. Wow. That's yeah. really cool. Um, so now you're married, Tim. Yes. Um, and then your son, Oliver, um, He's about 12, 12 and a half, so the same age as my daughter. One of the things, when we first met, we were chatting about a trip that you just went on to Italy. Right. And then it just kind of like, I think you guys were there longer, but effectively like almost the same trip that I just went on with my wife and kids. Um, how do you, like, because I feel 12 is a great year, age for traveling. How, how is that experience? How do you love, do you like, do you enjoy traveling with your, with your son? I absolutely yeah. love traveling with him. I love showing him the world as I'm learning it too, because yeah. I hadn't been to Italy before. Um, and I think that's one of the greatest joys. I think that's why we work so hard is so yeah. that we can travel more. Yeah. And he loved it as well. Like, I'm, I'm very curious to see, and I don't know if you're the same, to see how these life experiences will change them or how it's building them totally um and we i guess that'll happen over time but you sort of see little snippets now he'll yeah. be reading a book in school and be like oh i've been there or i experienced this yeah. when i was in italy so yeah it's one of my greatest joys I, and I, what i because i would agree with that 100 percent. what I, and what i love is for me what i see already is that through travel they they're way more curious so they don't have that like well i don't like this i don't like this so i went with my oldest for um uh to a to a restaurant on friday and it was like really like you know interesting japanese food and we kind of like you know just experimented with everything and she was just trying everything and cool. she's like oh I, I didn't think i would like that i really like that can we order more and so like she's just so open it. and uh, to me that's what travel does is it, it puts them in situations that are new to them and yeah. it, it kind of forces them to be creative right so, i totally agree and yeah. i i think one of the next trips i want to take with ollie is to sh take him to a cocoa farm yeah just yeah. to see sort of where it all starts. Yeah. So that's going to be on the books. No, I, uh, I love that. So I'm curious to know in, in business, like, let's go back to business for a second. What, what are you, cause right now you're, you're, you've just opened up your second shop, right? Mm -hmm. So you have now one in Sherwood Park where you produce the, the products, but you also have a second shop in Edmonton. Yes. So 
is that kind of is that what is exciting you these days or when you think about when you wake up in the morning um what's kind of the most what what do you get the most excitement um in terms of work Honestly, it depends on the day. I yeah. get excited about most things. So, <laughs> you know, I love this time of the year where it's really, really busy. I love being in packaging or in the, you know, production, just helping and just seeing the volume of bonbons we're making. Yeah. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, I, I believe the production manager told me yesterday, next week we have on target to do 50,000 bonbons. Wow. So it's, it's... Just in one week? One day. In one day. Well, oh, shit. No, sorry. One week. That is one week. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That is one week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So it's intense, right? And so... I love the intensity that brings me joy. It's not sustainable long term. It's just like for a couple of weeks we can do it. Um, but designing chocolates brings me joy as well. Like yeah. our upcoming Italian road trip collection if for spring 2024 has me super excited. And obviously I had to be in Italy five weeks to design the collection because yeah. four weeks definitely wouldn't have been long enough. <laughs> See, oh, that's good. See, you yeah. have like good excuses because you have like the chocolate excuse, but then also the fashion excuse to travel. Right. right? Yes. I, had, <laughs> I need to lean more on the fashion side. A hundred percent. So a ton of stuff gets me excited. I think opportunities to share my story gets me excited. So doing things like... Um, the Christmas in November at the Jasper Park Lodge. Right. Love that. So, yeah. There's didn't no that land on, like, your busiest? We were chatting with that. Like, wasn't Because d- didn't you have, like, an advent calendar and Being stuff Being packed that up? week, yeah. So I missed <laughs> that. But the team killed it without me. They got it done in record yeah. time. So I guess I don't need to be there next they're year. They're realizing. They're like, we don't really need her. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. So you mentioned you kind of have six months that's kind of your busy yeah. season. So how, do, how does that work? work for me i what i enjoy because i i kind of have everything that i do uh, through abf kind of in the same way where it's like really busy six months and then six months to kind of breathe what do you do with that like knowing that you know you kind of have six months where it's going to be less is that when you're kind of imagining you know okay how are we you know what what are our um like what 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 did you call them like um you have like your fashion seasons kind of thing is that when you're thinking about like how that's all gonna go yeah so we design a year ahead okay so in our summer months is when we do all of our r d all of our shelf testing okay. all of that happens in the summer so that we're ready to fly sort of the next year year and a half right right um so it is and we're still in production i mean we're producing year round um but it's really the d- design strategy time when we're doing a lot of our planning yeah. and, you know, inventory planning, all of that, making sure we have enough packaging for all the SKUs. And yeah. I think that's the most, one of the more challenging parts of the business is we have 160 SKUs. Yeah. So managing wow. each component of each SKU. And then, so what is the, bu- so Christmas is the busiest season? Yeah. And then Valentine's Day? No. Easter? Yes. Okay, Easter. Uh, like, wh- wh- where does Valentine's kind of land in? Oh, barely. So this really, is really hey? like Valentine's is like this little blip because it's one person buying for one person or two if they're naughty. Like, it's, <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's like it's it's small purchases, lots of small purchases, whereas Christmas right. we have companies buying five, six hundred boxes yeah. at a time. Interesting. So it's very different. And then Easter gets it's closer to Christmas because people are buying for multiple people. Right, right, right. And they're filling that Easter basket. So gotcha. it's, it's many purchases yeah. versus one box for one person. See, Valentine's Day for me, because I am married and I have two daughters, but my daughter's also born on Valentine's Day. Oh. So in our family, it's like a huge day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But yes, okay, it's and not... And people co- will buy for their kids too, right? So I'm being facetious oh, yeah, when yeah. I say two if they're naughty, but they'll yeah. buy for their kids and their totally. wife or husband or whatever. Yeah. But it's not... No, people aren't buying massive quantities. Totally. That makes sense. That's interesting. I would have thought it would be bigger. Um, You had another quote. So you you had mentioned that your ultimate career goal (laughs) is to be, quote unquote, a philanthropic lady who lunches with Chardonnay. Yeah. So you just want to get day drunk every day. Well, no, I would be planning different philanthropic events. Okay. But Chardonnay oh, okay. definitely okay. helps with creativity, right? And I feel like Chardonnay <laughs> is the daytime wine, so that's what I would drink. Yeah. Um, but I feel it's very important to have very specific goals. Yes, uh, yes. So um, I don't know if I'll ever get there. That's why we do a lot of philanthropy through the business. Totally. So what are your, when you, you know, when you think about your goals, and I, I'm always curious from a, from a personal perspective, but also through business. So when you look five years from now, what does, what does J6 look like to you? In well, that we're able to give back more mm-hmm. to the community, um, that we have a bigger team, that we're able to buy more cacao from the farmers, because the more cacao we buy, more beans we buy, the better off their livelihoods are as well, because chocolate can transform when we buy, you know, purposely and ethically. Yeah. Um, 
and more travel. Like yeah. in, in five years, if I have the flexibility to travel, especially in the down seasons in summer, I mean, that, that yeah. is success to me. Oh, hundred um, percent. You've already expanded into a second location. Do you see more locations in your future? It's too soon. It's only been open three weeks. Uh, we're <laughs> definitely going through some of the challenges of you know, operations at this yeah. time of the year with a new location. Yeah. You think I would have learned the first time I opened something December 1st? No, apparently not. Um, you got to write this not. shit down. You can't be like, oh, right. Okay, Short term memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And granted, the construction took way longer than we thought. Um, I don't know. I, I'm really, we need to get through the Christmas season to really determine, I think, sort of what our next plans are strategically. But I do know it will be growth. There yeah. will be growth. Yeah. Whether it's retail or not, I don't know. Yeah. No, interesting. Um, awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. It was, yeah, it was really you. neat, you know, meeting you in, like, I just feel like everybody that was, w that was in Jasper this year, it just was such a fun team. Such a fun um, team. And, uh, so it was really nice to kind of get to sit in on as many seminars and learn about you guys. Um, one thing that I learned is that chocolate pairs really, really well with milk. Is that right? <laughs> If you love your milk, definitely yeah. pair it with milk. <laughs> Actually, I will say this. In your seminar, um, it was port. Yes. Right? In the morning at 10 a.m. Yeah. It, who doesn't need a nice <laughs> cup of port first thing in the morning? Um but it's actually really good. Like I didn't I, I don't think I've ever had port. So I was really scared because it just looked like this thick wine yeah, it was or a something super approachable port and uh, i was like oh damn maybe i should be drinking more port in the morning but yeah uh, we all should really yeah. yeah no it's uh it was just cool getting to know you and learning you know what you're doing um i just never you know the ideas of you know combining your passion um with of chocolate with with fashion just like super very unique very Thank unique you. so i'm uh, i'm glad that you were you know, taking some time out of your crazy season to sit down with me. I appreciate that. It's my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Thanks, Jackie. <laughs> Thanks. Jacqueline. Jackie, do you punch people when they call you Jackie? No, no, that's good too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>